Today's scripture is found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, on page number 2 in the Bibles under your chairs in front of you. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man." Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Foothill. Good to see you all here today. Welcome to our Real Marriage series. We're uh, super excited about this, and I want you to know, uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, this is not original to us. Uh, a guy by the name of Mark Driscoll and his wife Grace, who are pastor, he's a pastor up at uh, Mars Hill Church in Seattle, wrote this book, and uh, and so we decided what we wanted to do over the next five weeks is it's an eleven week, eleven chapter book, but we're going to take uh, many of the chapters in here, and we're just going to sort of use them as a launch pad to talk about what the Bible says about marriage. And so you've picked. A great time to be at Foodle Church, and hopefully if you find this uh, series uh, helpful to you, then you will, uh, you'll invite your friends and uh, and family to join you uh, in the coming weeks. Um, It seems like we're at a season at Foothill Church where God's bringing us a lot of uh, families and couples and uh, marriages, and what that means is marriages are what they are, and people are who they are, and so a lot of times that means that uh, they're not perfect marriages, which is why I like the fact that this book and this series is called Real Marriage because uh, real marriages aren't perfect. Real mar- marriages have flaws and, and, and problems, and, and they're messy. And so we, we, we just want to serve you over these coming weeks. And if you have problems in your marriage, you're saying, you know what, I, I want to know how to do this. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to I just get some, some, some wisdom from Scripture and from Jesus Christ and from God about what we're supposed to have as a marriage. Then you, you're here at a, a great time. But I thought we'd do something. Let's give away a couple of books here. And so, first of all, let me just ask, if you've, uh, uh, if you're married less than five years, raise your hand. Who's married less than five? All right. Less than, uh, less than three. Put them down if you're less than three. Less than two. Okay. Less than one. Oh, we're still got some standing. Okay. Less than six months. Whoa, right on. All right. Less than three months. We're down. One, two. Uh, okay. Uh, how in the back, how long? Three months. Three months. About a month and a half. Month and a half. They beat you, and Andre. All right. <laughs> Raise your hand, Michelle. Would you give that for them? Awesome. Way to go. Congratulations. <clears throat> Let's, uh, let's go in the opposite direction. Um, if you've been married over 20 years, raise your hand. I know you guys have. Come on. Over 20 years. <laughs> over, 20, over 30. Come on. Keep them raised. Over 40. We got one standing. Alan, Betty, how long have you been married? (laughs) Woo! (laughs) That's awesome. 57 years. So, Al, you know what? I'm done. You come up and you you tell us how to do this thing. That's, That's amazing. That's awesome. All right, well, here's the thing. I'm not going to preach a book, okay? We're, we, we preach from the Bible, and normally, if, you're from, if you are new to Foothill Church, we take books of the Bible and go through them. And like I say, all I want to do is talk about uh, the principles that are found in this book, take us to Scripture, show us what Scripture says about those. And the first one I want to talk about is that you can have a new marriage with the same spouse. I think this book is very, very practical. Uh, I think it is a, a, a good a supplement, and if you want to get a copy of that, we'll have extra copies for you to purchase. Um, some lucky people each week will probably give away some of those, but, but we've got those. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if you ever heard the name Admiral James Stockdale. He was an admiral during the, the Vietnam War, and he, he launched his, uh, his, his plane off the, uh, the deck of the USS Oriskany and, and flew over Vietnam, and he was actually shot down, taken captive, and put in uh, the notorious Hanoi Hilton, where he spent, I don't know, something like eight to ten years in this uh, POW camp, enduring all kinds of torture. I mean, the guy was beat eaten several times. He was uh, hooked up to electricity. I mean, he was, he had all kinds of things that they did to him to torture him and beat him. And yet throughout the entire process, uh, he believed he would get out. And he developed uh, this great camaraderie with the other POWs that were in there. They looked to him as a leader. They looked to him as a man that motivated them and helped them uh, stay alive during such horrific circumstances. In fact, uh, the story goes that said that they had developed some sort of mor Morse code with, as they would sweep out in the yard, they weren't allowed to talk to each other. And so they would, with their, with their brooms, they would tap out while he was in a, in a confinement cell. They would sneak up next to the cell where he could hear him and they would tap out we love you. After the war was over, he got out, he escaped, and, and Jim Collins, who actually wrote a great book called Good to Great, interviewed him and said to him, man, how in the world, right? How did you do this? And Admiral Stockdale, his response, he said something I'll never forget. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. In other words, what Admiral Stockdale had was hope, was just hope. Um, it's said that, uh, that a man can live 40 days without, uh, without food. He can live f uh, four days without water. He can live about four minutes without air. But you can't live four seconds without hope. The book of Job, Job is crying out and he says in chapter 7, I think it's verse 6, he says, my days come to an end without hope. See, when you don't have hope, it'll kill you. When you do have hope, it'll bring you life. And what's true in your life is true in marriage. Some of what you need to hold on to, some of your marriages are on the ragged edge and, and some of you have just lost hope. You don't know. And so I want to start this whole series talking to married couples who are saying, is there any hope? And the answer is, I'm going to tell you the conclusion before we get there, there's hope. There's great hope for you. You can have the kind of marriage that God intends you to have. And so before we dive into all the practicalities and some of the issues that are facing marriage, I want to talk to you this morning about the fact that you, there is great hope for you to have the kind of marriage that God wants you to have. And so what you're going to see is that God intended something for marriage that he wants to be true even today, but something happened to that marriage, something happened to your and my marriage, and there's a remedy to it. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going this morning quickly, and I just want to help you understand what's happening here. So we're in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start where the Bible starts. We're going to listen to what the Bible has to say. It's the first book of your Bible. It's the book of beginnings. It's on page 2 of your Bibles, and, uh, and, and basically, here's the story up to the point where we're going to start reading today. God, uh, in, in the beginning, the very first chapter says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God creates it all. God speaks. He doesn't go to a, you know, uni universal Lowe's and Home Depot store and say, I need some of these raw materials. He just goes, boom, and things come into existence. I want to see a platypus. Boom, there's a platypus. I want to see trees. Boom, I want to see mountains. Boom, I want to see glaciers. Boom, I mean, God does it all, and he does it all with his word, and he creates it. And after every day, he gets done, and he says, this is good. Oh, what I I did today is good. And he does this for five days. He finally gets the sixth day, and as the pinnacle of his creation, he creates a man, Adam, the Bible calls him. And he says, oh, this is, this is great. Look what I've done. I've created, I've created this man, and this is beautiful, and this is wonderful. And, and, then, um, and then you get to chapter 2, and God says something astonishing in verse 18, if you didn't notice it. In chapter 2, verse 18, he looks at Adam and he says, it's not good. First time he's ever said that. It's not good because Adam's alone. 
And so he decides he's going to make him, I mean, because here's what happens. God creates all the animals of the field and the birds of the air and everything, and he brings them to Adam. And he says, okay, Adam, you've got dominion over all of this. Go ahead and name them. Tell, do you go ahead and you, you, so he looks and he goes, okay, well, that, that's a, that's a, a, a peacock and a peahen, and that's a, that's a buck and a doe, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a boar and a sow. And he starts looking, and, and no doubt about it, Adam's sitting there watching this, if you will, parade of animals and going, well, wait a sec, God, there's, there's one of him and one of her, another one of him, another her, but there's one of me. What have you done? And, and God says, it's, it's not good. It's not good. And he does this intentionally. I'm going to show you why in a second. And so he brings Adam, he brings Eve to Adam. He makes her, forms her out of the dust. He, he, takes, he, takes, he puts Adam to sleep, pulls a rib out, forms Eve, and, and says, you know, here we go. Here, here's this woman and, and our first parents. Adam sees a naked woman. He gets pretty excited about that. It's now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. It'll be taken out of woman. Right? I mean, this is, this is a very exciting day for Adam. God officiates the we wedding. Adam recites his vows, and, and, uh, and everything's great. In fact, think of it this way. I mean, this is, this is they live in a perfect world. This is, I, 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 you and I cannot even fathom what that must be like. A perfect world. There's a perfect world relationship with Adam and Eve, right? He always is engaged with his wife, ladies. He's never reading the newspaper. Yes, honey, <laughs> right? She's always ready to be intimate with him. There's no headaches. He's just, yes, honey, right? I mean, it's, it's perfect, right? I mean, what, this is amazing. That everything goes exactly right with Adam and Eve. And very quickly, by the next chapter... It goes from this wonderful wedding to a war, right? <laughs> and you, some of you are like, wow, that's, that's pretty much the story of our marriage, right? <laughs> Started off great, right? I mean, what? Well, you wouldn't have gotten married, right? You, 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 you were best friends. Everything was great. You, you had this wonderful relationship, so dynamic. Uh, and, and then it's like war broke out. And the Bible says that's exactly what happened. Because that's what happened to Adam and Eve, right? Because that first marriage and your marriage and my marriage to Michelle play out in the context of a war. Now, we may not see it that way, but the Bible says this is very real. There is a very real battle going on between God and his enemies. And if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, you are on the front lines of that battle. And the closer you move, the more you move toward Jesus, the more you move toward wanting to become like Jesus, the more heated the battle becomes. Because Satan hates God, and Satan hates God's people, and Satan hates marriages, because as you're going to see in a minute, marriages were meant to be far more than marriages. They're supposed to reflect something that Satan absolutely doesn't want you to see. So, so, so the tension that you feel in your marriage, I want to, in some ways, provide you a little bit of consolation here. If you're like, man, we came today and I don't know, we, we feel this struggle all the time and I feel like there's war in our marriage. I think, I, then here's what I want to say to you. On the one hand, let, let's deal with that in a second, but, but you're normal. You're normal in the sense that that tension is as old as creation. That tension is as old as the garden, as old as Adam and Eve, where they felt this, right? The war you're experiencing is because you're in a battle. And listen, the enemy isn't your spouse. The enemy is Satan. And just so we're clear, they're not the same thing, <laughs> right? I know you're like, he's a devil. No, but, well, he's, he's not. Let me show you a picture of a young, happy couple. So we can get it up here. You got it back through the air there. Yep, that's us. Uh, that's 23 years ago, and uh, I had a lot of hair. Um, and, um, and that little girl I married, I promise she was of age. Um, I swear she was over 18. In fact, I remember when Michelle and I were first married, um, she, she used to wear these, like, little overalls, and... And we got on a plane one time, and on top of the overalls, then she had this, this sweatshirt that she just loved forever that she had cross-stitched a teddy bear on the front of. Okay, so get the picture here. 
And we get on, and I'm holding hands with her. And we're lovey-dovey. We're a new couple, you know. And I can just see these flight attendants looking at us like, what kind of creepiness is going on right now? <laughs> right? And they're literally like, 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 you see this couple? That's weird, you know. So finally, one of the flight attendants, she just can't take it anymore. She comes over, and she's like, excuse me, sweetie, how old are you? You know? And Michelle's like, guess. <laughs> she's 22 in that picture. And the, and the, the flight attendant goes, uh, 14. I'm like, what? what? What do you think I am, right? So she's of age there. But every time I see these pictures, I love it. Michelle looks beautiful, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for 23 years of marriage. I'm grateful that I've been married to the same woman for 23 years uh, by the grace of God. But at the same time, I look, and I look at that man in that picture, and I'm like, Chris, there's so much you don't know. Right? And if you're an engaged couple or a young you know, couple, you think you know, I'm just going to tell you right now, you know nothing. You, you think you know, you know nothing. And, and you try your best. And, you know, so like in our, in our married, uh, our, our premarital uh, group that, that we just got through, I mean, we, we, we do this about once a year. We take couples and, and truthfully, if we can break you up, that's our goal because we don't want you making that mistake. But we, we basically say, we basically say to you, here's about 10,000 questions over the course of this prep for marriage thing that you should ask each other to get to know each other as best as possible. I wish I would have, Michelle and I would have asked some of these questions. Uh, but we didn't. And, and so, so you look at, I'm going to say some things this morning that I did not know on day one of our marriage. Nobody ever told me these. I'm not, I'm not, not blaming. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just saying these are things that I don't think Michelle and I really unpacked for several years. And by God's grace, uh, we have endured. And, and, uh, but these things honestly never occurred to me. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. Okay, and I'm going to kind of float through Genesis chapter 3. And we're going we're gonna to paint with some pretty broad strokes. And uh, we don't have time to unpack everything that's there. But I, I want you to see a couple of key things. And I want to start off by talking about God's intent. Do you understand God has a purpose for marriage? There is an intent that he has. See, I think I knew when I got married that marriage was, I might say, a God thing. Marriage is something that God looked down and smiled upon. Marriage is something ordained by God. Some of you come out of a religious background. You say, you know what we did? We, we, weren't that re we really weren't Christians or we really weren't that religious. But, you know, we like religion and we like the fact that we were in a chapel and that felt very holy and pure and whatever. And so you, 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 you had the sense that God smiled on this thing called marriage, but, uh, but you didn't really understand that, that he actually had a purpose for your marriage, for my marriage. And I want you to see this. God has a purpose for marriage. There's an intent behind what he does. And so to start there, let's just, let me just give you a couple things. First of all, marriage is designed by God. This is God's idea. Your marriage to that man, to that woman, is God's idea. Now, you may think that then God is an evil God. Okay? Some of you. But I'm telling you, it's not a mistake that you're, who with, you, you're, you're with who you are. God brought Eve to Adam and said, here you go. Take her, you, take each other. This is now the marriage that I want. God does that. God still does that today. A and he brought you two together and he designed it and he did this. This is God's idea. Adam comes in and he, you know, he, he gives his wedding vows. He recites them before God. He takes this woman. This is designed by God. Marriage is a God-given institution that God wants to see thrive in this world. Second of all, God intended marriage to bring you joy. <laughs> Some of you can't believe that's even true. Joy through intimacy. You understand, marriage is intimate by the design of God. God looks at Adam as he's sulking, watching male and female everything go, you know, go in front of him and goes, it's not good. And I did this on purpose because I want Adam to see something. I want Adam to long for something. I want him to crave something here and see that he's missing something. See, see, this is astonishing. God looks and for the first time in, in Scripture up to this point, this is the first time he says something is not good. 
He said, good, 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 very good. Everything's good. And now he looks and says, this is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. I don't think that's just a statement to Adam. I think that's a statement for you and me. And I think this is why that, that research tells us that 90% of us, uh, a, 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 when we weren't married, 90% of you who are not married want to be married. You, you, you crave it. You, you desire it. You, you want that. Look at. In other words, Adam was incomplete, okay? There was no completer for him yet. And what God is doing is not just showing us this ancient couple and saying, oh, isn't that a cute story? Isn't that an interesting story? He's showing you yourself. He's showing us who we are, how he wired us. And what it means is that you and I were built for intimacy, we, we, were, we were built. God built me and you. He built Adam in, before the fall. He built us. Now hear me and don't misunderstand me. He built us so that we needed something more than him. Now if you're a Christian, we understand, and this is true, God satisfies our deepest longings. If you're not a believer, there are deep longings of your heart that only Jesus Christ can fill. But, but let me say it this way. He personally doesn't satisfy all of your longings. And what do I mean by that? I mean that he, he creates us so that we long for another. You long to belong to another and you long for another to belong to you in a significant way. And it's very few people in this world, Apostle Paul being one of them, that says, no, God's given me a gift of singleness. Now, maybe God's given some of you that. But that indeed is a very rare thing because God, he, he wired us for intimacy in this kind of relationship. So this is why God says, okay, so you're gonna bring these two together and, he's, and he pronounces this conclusion in verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, fascinating word by the way, and they shall become one flesh, one flesh. So that sexual union in marriage is a picture of this, but this is talking about more than sex. This is saying that within the context of marriage, there will be uh, two people that become one socially, that become one economically, that become one psychologically, spiritually, physically. This is what your, your, your marriage is, is driving toward over. It's not, not day one. Of course, there's a, there's a mysterious union that happens on day one, but over time, this is what unfold so that what happens is that you, you become united in time in your goals, in your faith, in your vision, in your knowledge, in your hopes, in your hurts. I mean, they even say that couples that live with each other long enough start to look like each other. Have you heard this? Because they start to, they start to use facial expressions over years that mimic the other person, and so their face starts to kind of do some of the same things. That's part of becoming one. See, God wired you for intimacy. You want it. That is not, I tell my, my boy, my, you know, Tucker, as he's growing, I mean, look, look, the, the, the fact that you're attracted to girls, you know, you, you can't date till you're 90, but, but the fact that you're, you're that's a good thing. I mean, that's a good, God gave that to you. He, you long for an intimacy with a girl. That's a God-given gift, okay? See, now, I mean, think about that. I mean, why do we chase intimacy? And the fact of the matter is, we chase it all our lives. This is why little boys pinch little girls, right, on the, on the playground. It's like they're weird, immature, pew, oh, I touched a girl, right? I, I feel there's this sense of intimacy. I mean, this is why teenagers primp for hours to make it look like they didn't primp for hours because they want somebody, somebody look at me. Somebody need me. I, I want to be needed. I want to need you. <laughs> right? This is what guys... We do stupid things when we fall in love. I mean, our, 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 our world just get weird. Like, like, like one day we're eating Top Ramens with our hand, you know, and the next day we're talking about salad forks. <laughs> I mean, listen, I went to a Barry Manilow concert with Michelle. <laughs> Who does that? I always love him, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. You just, you're just like, I, I love her so much, I'll see Barry Manilow, you bet. Now, why do we do that? Because the fact of the matter is, like so much of what you do, you do it because it brings you joy. Joy. You understand God made joy. <laughs> 
God is not a cosmic killjoy curmudgeon that when you start experiencing joy, it's like, well, you know, uh, I hope you get over that pretty soon when we get back to being serious. <laughs> you know, in fact, Ecclesiastes says this, it is a gift of God for you to enjoy what he's given you. It's amazing to me. The fact that you can take the resources and the money and not hoard it, but you can go enjoy it, that's a gift of God, Ecclesiastes says. So, so God wired you this way. He said, look, at one of the greatest channels of joy in your life is intimacy. And so you chase it. You run a God designed that. God isn't sitting there, you know, you long for sexual intimacy and when it's happening, God's like, well, let me know when it's done, right? Because I can't look. No, God says, I made that. I made that for a married couple within the bonds of marriage to enjoy that. I, I, and we'll talk about this later on in this series, but I mean, that is God's idea. God is a gracious, joy-filled God who sees that part of marriage, what he wants you to, uh, to, to, to uh, achieve is to enjoy your spouse. Do you enjoy your spouse? You know, the fact of the matter is that couples that, you, that I counsel a lot of times, and if they've gone too far especially, they, they've gotten to a place where they just don't, in, they, the enjoyment stopped long ago. That's the bad news. There's good news coming, okay? But, but, but this is what God did. This is how God designed it. Okay, the third thing I want you to see is that God intended your marriage, my marriage, every marriage to reflect something bigger than marriage. Okay, you, you gotta understand this. This is, this is absolutely profound and I, I don't think I fully understood. The fact, I don't know that I still fully appreciate what this means in my marriage and, and how this can be seen. But listen to this and, and, and this is Paul writing and ladies, he's gonna talk to you first and here's what he says in chapter five of Ephesians, verse 24. He says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now look at I know I just said the dreaded S word, and some of you are like, oh, you know, we should never say, no, no this is the Bible, okay, so I'm just going to tell you, here's what, here's what it means. It means, it means, he's saying, look, look at the church and look at Christ. Look how they relate to each other. That's what your marriage ought to look like. So ladies, it looks like you submitting to Christ the way that the church, uh, to, to your husband, the way the church, it's not, not, not women to men, wives to husbands, the way the church submits to Christ, and what does that, what does that look like? There's a respect for Christ. There's an honoring of Christ. There, there's a deference to Christ. There's, a, there, there's this thankfulness for Christ because he laid down his life for his people. Now, we'll get to the men here in a second, but isn't it interesting as I, as I you know, kind of listen and hear that one of the things that you hear husbands saying that ha is gone from their marriage is my wife doesn't respect me anymore. She's not thankful. She's an honor. There's, there's none of that anymore. Okay, well, that, that very well could be because your side of the equation is gone. You're not doing what Paul says to you men, and here's what he says to us men. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up. That's death. He died for her. I mean, I tell every married couple I know, I've never met, I've never, ever seen a, a problems in a marriage or submission be a problem where a man has nail scars in his hands. You're that kind of husband? Submission is an issue. The church joyfully submits to Christ. And a husband, look guys, right? We got it easy. All we have to do is be like Jesus. No problem. <laughs> lay down our lives. So, so it's meant to reflect that. It's meant there's this greater reality, Christ and the church, and can people look in and somehow see that? So this is God's intent. We go on and on, but here's God's big idea for marriage, that this is what it would look like. But, but here's the problem. We look at our marriages. I look at mine and go, uh, I don't think it really looks like this. I don't think I'm doing that the way I should. And I, I, I see that God intended certain things, but, but uh, sometimes marriage isn't joyful and sometimes intimacy is lacking and sometimes, you know, I wonder if our marriage is reflecting the greater glory of Christ and the church. 
And so this is where the problem comes in. We see God's intent, but there's a problem, and that problem is that, that sin has an effect on marriage, okay? And this is chapter three of Genesis, okay? What, what's happening to us, what's to my marriage, what's happening to your marriage, why is God's intent, why do I look at my marriage and say, this is not playing out the way it should, something's wrong here, and in varying degrees, to we're hanging by a thread, to we're, you know, we're, we're just struggling right now, that's what chapter three is telling you. There is a problem. There's a real problem that you have to deal with. And if you don't deal with the real problem, you'll never get to what God intended for your marriage. Okay? And this is something that the Bible calls sin. Okay? This is the problem with your marriage. Okay? So, so here's what happens. In chapter 3 of Genesis, everything's perfect. Then the serpent comes along and uh, he, it says he's more crafty than all the other beasts. And he says to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And then she adds, neither shall you touch it. lest you." God never said, don't touch it. God said, don't eat it lest you die. And look what the next thing the serpent says. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. In the Hebrew, it says, not will you surely die. In other words, you liar, liar. Are you kidding me? God would hold back joy from you? Follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you to do, Eve and Adam. Go that direction. I mean, I tell my kids all the time, we're watching the Disney movie. Here it comes, right? Here's where it's the follow your heart scene, you know. Do what your heart tells you. Always go that direction. Listen, I'm telling you, the Bible says you do that. It's destruction. Every time. Every time. And so she follows her heart. He follows his heart. And they take the fruit. And, and it's not an apple. I don't know what it was. But they sin and everything changes. Headaches, yes, honey. <laughs> Anxiety, problems, stress, sexual immorality, lust, all in pornography. I mean, just fractures everything. It, it opens up, if you will, sort of this breath of hell and sin comes out and now the rest of the Bible, the trajectory that runs through this book is the swelling impact of sin and in response to that, the swelling, the, the super swelling of God's grace to swallow it up. And, 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 and listen, what that means is that in that moment in chapter 3 where this happened, it, it means that it devastated everything, including our marriages. And I'm going to show you this in a second. So, 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 look, I have yet to encounter a marital problem in my marriage, in, in any marriage I've ever talked uh, 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 to, that the root cause is not sin. Always, 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 always. Okay, there's never a moment when that's not the problem. And, and now look, I'm not necessarily talking about Michelle's sin against me. I, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily in those terms, you know, she did bad. I'm talking about the fact that the problem with marriage is that I'm a sinner. She's a sinner. And you put those two things together and it's like a spark hitting fuel. And this is where problems erupt. So, so look, God says, all right, so, so, so Adam and Eve, they take the fruit, they eat it, their eyes are open, they realize they're both naked, and now they are ashamed. Remember the end of verse 20, 25? They were naked, they weren't ashamed. There was no shame in the world at all, right? Isn't that interesting that, like, like if somebody gets caught naked, unless you're a pervert, you, you, there's, there's something about covering up really quick, there's a shame to it? And God says, now that's exactly what's happening, and, 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 and they hear the sound and God is walking in the garden. They hide themselves and they cover themselves with fig leaves and they don't know what to do. And God calls out and says, where are you? Where have you gone? Why are you, why are you where you are? Why are you not coming out to be with me? And Adam steps forward and says, uh, we were afraid of you because we realized we were naked. And God says, how did you know? Who told you we were naked? And then he explains the story where the serpent came and he offered us and we took and we ate and he tries to blame his wife. He's like, oh, how could you? Why did you do this? Don't you just, you're following your heart and it kills you every time. 
And then God pronounces what are called curses starting in verse 14 and, he, and he's gonna curse the serpent and he's gonna curse the woman and he's gonna curse the man. And ladies, I'm not picking on you this morning, but, but I want you to see something about verse 16 that's very interesting. Look at, look at chapter three, verse 16, because this applies to both men and women here. This is his curse. He says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. So apparently before the fall, birth was just like, woohoo, we got a child, right? Now it's like, it's screaming, it's crying. So when you're, you know, when you get pregnant someday, ladies, you, you can just, you know, curse out Eve, not your husband. But so, so, so here you are, and so there's going to be pain. But look at the next thing. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, that's strange. Some people read that and go, oh, there's going to be a sexual desire for her husband. Well, if that's true, then guys in this room are like, please curse my wife, right? <laughs> I'd like her to be more cursed, really curse her bad, God, right? Okay, this, is not, this is not sexual desire. Let me tell you how I know that. Look over at chapter 4, verse 7. He's talking to Cain now. Same exact construction. If you do well, Cain, will you not be accepted? But if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Conflict. Now there's going to be this conflict between sin and mankind. And man, you had better confront sin. It wants to master, it wants to overtake, it wants its desire. This is, a, this is a craving desire. This is a desire to overthrow. This is a desire to manipulate. This is a desire to get my way at your expense. And, and look, and then he shall, back to Eve's curse, he shall rule over you. This is the battle of the sexes. What is the history of men and women? Men abusing, domineering women. Women trying to manipulate and get control. And, and, and look, neither of those are what God intends. God doesn't want your marriage to be a marriage where a man dominates you. That's a curse. God doesn't want your marriage to be a marriage where you try to manipulate and overthrow and get your way and, and, and get around and nag and whatever. No, he doesn't want that. That's not his desire. His desire is that those things would be broken. So marriage is a battleground. And, and the mistake we make is thinking that the cause of our battle is our spouse, right? So, so for me, like, like what, if I identify Michelle as the problem, then Michelle's the solution in this way. Stop it. You're a bad person. You're the problem with our marriage. Make our marriage better. Okay, no, no. <laughs> That's not how it works, right? If she's the problem, she's the remedy. She needs to do better. She needs to be a better wife. She, she makes me angry. You ever said that to your spouse? You, you make me angry. No, no one makes you angry. You're angry. That's why you get angry. You have anger in your heart, right? The truth is Michelle is not the cause and I'm not the cause. The root cause is that I sin. I'm a sinner. That's my nature and I'm just acting out of my inner nature. So the problem with my marriage is that I'm a sinner and I'm married to a sinner. And so are you or so you will be. And that is catastrophic, without Christ. I mean, listen, here, here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. He says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that defiles a person. In other words, you're sitting there like, wow, where did that come? You know, where did that come from? I just, I just kind of, I had a slip of the tongue. I'm really sorry. That was a mistake. I don't know what I was doing. No, no. You knew exactly what you're doing, and it came out because that's what's in your heart, okay? You, you know, I've used the illustration before at Foothill of, of, of this pipe that at the end is just pouring out sewage, well, you can't look at that pipe and say, well, that's disgusting. But back at the source, it's pure, clean water. No, it's not. It's sewage. What's coming out of this is coming out of where it's coming from. There's something polluting your heart, and that's why every sin you ever commit comes from your heart. Uh, G.K. Chesterton one time was, uh, responded to a newspaper article where, where, the, where the editors posed this question, send in essays to their readers. They said, send in essays that answer the question, what's wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton's kind of a smart aleck, brilliant guy, but he basically sends back a two-word reply. What's wrong with the world? And he writes... I am. That's very honest. What's wrong with my marriage? 
I am. So, so we look at Adam and Eve and we go, what went wrong? Everything was so great. And the answer is, sin went wrong. You look at your own marriage, you say, what went wrong? We, we started off so good, right? We used to have this great marriage for the first five hours, right? For five days, seven years. Talk about seven-year itch, right? Everybody gets it, and then they kind of crack. Everything, I, mean, I look back, and I have fond, fond memories of those early years, but look at where we are now. What happened? Sin happened to everybody. So, see, I used to think Michelle, when I fought, she's the problem. Fix her, right? She used to think he's the problem. Fix him. We're the cause. And, and the truth is, in the heat of the moment, we still think that at times. And, and, and that tells you that we're not as far as maybe you think we are, and we still wrestle with this stuff. But look, the fact is, I'm the cause. She's the cause. We're both the cause. I sin because I'm a sinner, because that's what's percolating out of my heart. So look at every past, present, or future marriage in this room, every single one, is and will be meant to reflect God's intent for marriage. All the things we've talked about. But every past, present, future marriage in this room is also filled with sinners married to sinners. And that spells disaster for almost one out of two marriages. Why is there so much divorce in our world? There's one answer, sin. Sin. So, so then what's our hope? What hope do Michelle and I have? Man, if I'm a sinner, this is coming from inside of me and I can't just reform and I'm going to do better, whatever. What hope do I have? Like, what's the hope for every marriage in this room? Whether you're, you know, just kind of struggling, you're hanging by a thread. What's the hope? See, some of you think that the only hope you have is to punt. The only hope you have is to be done with this marriage, go find a new one. <laughs> and I'm telling you right now, hear me. I'm not saying you shouldn't get out of abusive, you know, that, that a husband, listen, if your husband's beating you, you should get out, okay? That, there is never any biblical warmth. But let's talk about normal marriages that are having marital strife and problems. The answer is you don't punt and sign up for another because the problem with that is that wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so you can go get a new wife, but guess what? You have the same heart. And if you have the same heart but a different wife, you're going to have the same problems. You're going to annoy her like you did the first one. <laughs> All those things will begin to percolate to the surface, right? Because, look it, that's what happens. It's coming out of my heart. And the Bible says, no, 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 we can deal with that. That's the whole point of this, is that we don't just come along and reform and become more moral people. The gospel, the Bible says, I'll get inside of you and I will recreate the heart that I've given you. And now you'll have new desires. You'll have new loves. Everything will be new. And so I want you to see the gospel's hope for marriage. Because frankly, this is the only hope that you and I have. <laughs> Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, if anyone's in Christ, what does that mean? Doesn't, oh, I just like this guy named Jesus. No, it means if I, have, if I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ and said, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I can't save myself. I see the sin in my life. I turn to him. I repent. I trust in him. And the Bible says, if you're in Christ like that, you are a new creation. Behold, the old has passed. The new has come. The Bible is all about taking the old and making it new. All the way to Genesis, to, to Revelation chapter 21. In the beginning, you had Genesis, everything falls, everything cracks. You get to Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, and you have Jesus proclaiming, behold, I am making all things new. It's all new. And that's the story of the Bible. That can be your story. That can be our story. The God of the Bible is a God of new beginnings, and you don't have to keep going down the path you're on. And he, and he says, look, I'm perpetually doing new things all the time. He says in Ezekiel, in Zechariah, here, Jeremiah, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out that heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, a new heart. A new heart will I put within you. See, that's the drama that unfolds in the Bible. And the greatest news is not that God set aside this club of people and said, you know, these are pretty great people and I like them. The great news is that he is constantly inviting people into that renewal. 
And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and your heart hasn't been changed and the heart of stone hasn't been pulled out and you don't have a heart of flesh, you can be part of that renewal today. See, see, you can enter into a new creation that God is making and that new creation can include your marriage. You don't have to go get a new spouse. You can have the same spouse and a brand new marriage. So look, I don't think this is pie in the sky. I've seen it happen. I saw couples this morning. I look at and I go, they were dangling by a thread. By the grace of God, God has brought them back together. There's new hearts involved. There's new desires involved. Look at Michelle and I haven't had a perfect marriage. You know, by the grace of God, look at without God's mercy in our lives, we would be one of those couples that you know, you know about. They share a bed. They share a coffee pot. They barely talk to each other. They might share a bank account. Is that what you want? Some of you have resigned yourself, but I guess that's what we get. It doesn't have to be that way. God says, I want to make all things new. And then I can tell you right now, that's not Michelle and I. We, we don't just coexist with one another. I can tell you, as God is my witness, I'm not saying this because this is a real marriage series. I love Michelle more today than I did in that picture. No question about it. I, 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 we, and it's not because we've done everything right. We haven't. I've not been the greatest husband. Hear me. If I were grading it, I might get a C. I've failed Michelle in many ways. There's been ways that she's failed me, but here's the deal. Jesus has never failed. And Jesus is perfect. And we keep our eyes on Jesus and we keep saying, look, I know, I know I'm married to an imperfect person. And she knows, and there's grace and there's mercy and all these things. And we look and he said, look, if Christ is in us and if we keep our eyes on the ball and we keep following him, then look, he'll make us a new creation. He'll throw out the junk. He'll make, give us a new life, a new marriage, constantly being renewed throughout. I mean, I want to be married 57 years. I want to be married 75 years. I want to be married to the same woman. And I want to hold her hand. And I want to look out over the ocean someday and go, we made it, baby. We made it by the grace and mercy of God. See, our testimony isn't we've done it all right. Our testimony is that we're both sinners and Jesus has done it all right and Jesus has forgiven us. And so because he's, he's forgiven us, it's taught us to forgive each other. I didn't realize this when I first got married. I didn't realize the reason I should be forgiving is because I've been forgiven more than Michelle could ever do against me. There, there, there is no amount of sin that could overwhelm what Christ has forgiven me and so because of that I mean, Michelle says it all the time to our kids hold short accounts be quick to forgive not we're not talking about hey let's just sweep things under the carpet and act like they don't exist we're talking about let's genuinely forgive let's move on I mean my girls were asking me this morning before we came to church like dad Gracie said dad <clears throat> when was your first fight with mommy and I said probably about five minutes after we got married <laughs> um what'd you fight about I'm like I don't know probably something stupid I said do you think we fight well, you know, I said, but, but what's our fighting like? And we kind of all agreed. It's kind of like, you know, you're like, whoosh, you know, you bug, and you kind of get all upset, and then you're like, all right, we're friends. We love each other, right? I mean, it, it's, it's let's, just, let's just deal. Let's be done with it. This doesn't have to last for days or months or years. Let's hold short accounts, forgive each other, and move on. So, so God is teaching us this. Look at we're not carrying around bitterness in our marriage. Some of, some of you, bitterness is killing you. Because we look and say, Jesus isn't bitter at me. Jesus isn't going, dang it, you know? You keep doing this, Chris. It's really tick me off, right? I'm just, you just make me more and more bitter against you all the time? No, it's always. I don't have to be bitter against Michelle, right? Because Jesus, listen, he's not some dead prophet from 2,000 years ago. He's a living God. He's real. He really does transform lives. That's it. He transforms marriages. And so each of us, we're learning to love each other. Learning. I didn't say we're there. We're learning to love each other the way Christ loves us. We're learning to serve each other the way that Christ serves us. And, and we don't do it perfectly, but we know Jesus does, and we want to keep our focus there. So look at that's what I want to tell you this morning. And I've finished preaching, but you need to finish the sermon. Because it's real easy to walk out of here and go, heard a good sermon this morning, you know, God's story, a little bit of the Chris and Michelle, but what's God doing in your life? 
Are there areas where you need personally to say, God, I've been keeping this away from you. Are there places where you need to forgive one another? Are, are, there, are there areas where you'd say, God, come into our lives, be the center of this home, help us. Some of you have idolized marriage and you're always gonna be disappointed. Don't idolize marriage, idolize Jesus and you'll have a good marriage. So, so, so we're gonna end a, a little bit differently. We'll, 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 do, we'll do communion because you know what communion is? Well, I mean, communion is this big illustration of Christ's love and the hope of the gospel. He forgives, he cleanses, he wipes the clay clean. So it's all new. It's the new covenant in the blood of Christ that I'm coming, I'm gonna give you a new heart and we can celebrate that this morning. We'll do the offering and all that like we normally do. We'll sing, we'll praise God. But I wanna do something a little bit different this morning and I, I especially... I want to talk to the men real quickly. And I want to challenge you guys. If you're, a, if you're a Christian man, and I didn't say if you're married. If you're a Christian man, married or single, who says, you know what? I will commit myself publicly today to loving my wife, present or future, the way Christ loved the church and to lead my family for the glory of God. If that's you, I'm standing. I want you to stand with me right now. And I want you to take with me a sacred oath in the presence of God that you and I are going to say, and guys, we're not going to be like, we're going to say it because we're men. And we're going to say boldly in front of this congregation, this is what we'll stand for. This is what we'll do. And we're going to be the kind of men of God that he wants us to. If you have your wife with you or your fiance here today, Michelle, you can come up here. I want you to hold their hand. Just reach right now and grab their hand. If you're single, don't grab anybody's hand. <laughs> this is not a time to just, hey, find one. <clears throat> okay, and I, I want you to, and I want you to repeat after me like men. Okay, here we go. I will love my wife for her good and God's glory. I will love my wife for her good and God's glory. I will serve my wife for her good and God's glory. I will serve my wife for her good and God's glory. I will lead my family for their good and God's glory. Lead my family for their good and God's glory. I will pray over my wife for her good and God's glory. I will pray over my wife for her good and God's glory. And I will read the Bible in my home for our good and God's glory. And I will read the Bible in my home for our good and God's glory in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now stay standing, guys, because there's one other thing I want you to do. I want to pray for you. And when I'm done praying, I'm going to pray over you. And I want you to turn, if your wife or fiance is here with you, and if you're a single guy, you just stay standing and you pray for yourself. But if your wife or your fiance is here with you, I want you to turn and I want you to put your hands on her shoulders and I want you to pray over her. And I know some of you are like, Chris, I've never done that in my life and that's a little embarrassing. Let me say something to you. Your wife wants you to be a spiritual leader more than anything. And I can't tell you how many women have come up to me in the last six years and said, Chris, pray for my husband to be the spiritual leader. Guys, she craves it. She wants you to say, and this is where it starts. It just starts with you just praying over here. What, what can you pray? Just put your hands on her. And maybe the first thing you say, like I'm going to say to Michelle, is first of all, God, forgive me for not doing this more. And second of all, God, bless her. I thank you for her. And I pray, God, you'd come into the middle of this marriage. Guys, you can hear a message all day long and walk out of here and do nothing. This is where we put feet to this thing and say, let's actually make it mean something today in my family right now. And you love her. 
And you tell God, you know, I'm not saying you pray for 10 minutes. We're going to pray. I'll pray first for you. You stay standing. When I say amen, I'm going to turn to Michelle. You're going to turn to your wives. Single guys, you're going to stand there. And you're going to pray for yourself. And then we'll pray. And you pray quietly with, uh, among one another. The band will be playing in the background. And then look. And we're going to say amen. And then we'll do, we'll do offering. We'll do communion. We'll praise God together. And when you do communion, you know what would be great? If you take your wife with you. You'd grab the cup, you'd grab the bread, you'd give it to her, and you'd serve her. Just a small token, symbol of you saying, I want to serve you. Let's love our wives the way Christ loved the church and laid down his life for them. Okay? Guys, bow your heads. Stay standing. Let me pray over you.